Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this panel discussion on the West after the Ukraine war. I'm Terry Martin, a journalist and uh, TV news anchor based in Berlin. I'll be your moderator for this session. We have a remarkable group of speakers with us here today to, who will share their views on the implications and lessons of the Ukraine war, a war that has shaken Europe and the world. I'll introduce them in a moment, but first I just want to say how delighted I am to be here. This is my first uh, world policy conference. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me and extend my warm thanks also to Abu Dhabi for hosting this event. Now this session is focusing on the Ukraine war, a topic that has already received some attention at this conference. The uh, Hamas-Israel war may have bumped Ukraine from the uh, front pages, but as we heard yesterday from Ukraine's foreign minister, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is continuing with brutal consistency. Now, what we're dealing with today is, uh, is, is a very difficult topic. We have to be very honest about that. Uh, Mr. Kubela gave us an update on, on where Good things time. stand from his perspective in the Ukraine war uh, right now uh, as his country fights for its survival. In this session today, we're going to be looking at the conflict from a broader, longer-term perspective, and that, of course, is no easy task because, as we all know, the war is ongoing. Uh, nobody really knows how it's going to end. Uh, plus, the geopolitical context is rapidly changing. Uh, and what is the West anyway? That's in our title, What is the West? Uh, so for the purpose of this discussion, let's think of it mainly as liberal democratic societies, not limited to the geographical West, uh, who claim to value a rules-based international order. Okay, that's uh, what we're gonna work with as our working definition of the West for this session. So uh, a tough brief for this session, but we'll do our best to get a sense of where the West might be when the Ukraine war uh, is over. Now, fortunately, we have a distinguished uh, group of speakers who are extremely well qualified to reflect on this, and I'll introduce them in, in order. Uh, on my immediate left, uh, Elbe Dorj Tsakyagin. Yes, uh, that's right. Getting, working on that Mongolian pronunciation. He's the former president of Mongolia. Uh, he played a key role in leading the Mongolian revolution democratic revolution. He created the Elbeg Dorch Institute and is a commissioner of the International Commission Against the Death Penalty, a topic that you spent a lot of time working on. Uh, next is Bogdan Klich. He is a senator in the Polish parliament, currently serving as the chairman of the uh, Foreign and EU Affairs Committee in the Senate. He has served as Poland's Minister of Defense and was a member of the European Parliament as well. Yep. Beyond that, we have Zaki Laidi. He is special advisor to Joseph Borrell, the EU's high representative for uh, foreign affairs and security. He was formerly strategic advisor to the French prime minister. He's been a professor at Sciences Po for 20 years, over 20 years, and he's written numerous books on global affairs. And uh, someone who I'm been, I've been familiar with for a long time. Uh, Norbert Röttgen, we both live in Germany, is a member of the German uh, parliament, the Bundestag. He sits on the Bundestag's Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, he, which he led as chairman from 2014 to 2021. He has served as Germany's environment minister, and I remember being in background talks uh, in Copenhagen with you at an important COP a long time ago. You may not remember, remember that. And he is co-chair of the European Council on Foreign Relations. And joining us from Paris, uh, I hope you all can see him if he has, isn't uh, on, your, on our screen just yet, uh, Uber Vedrine, I hope you can hear me. Uber Vedrine was going to try to join us remotely. His flight, I understand, from Paris uh, had a problem and he wasn't able to join us. He was, he was trying to be here, but uh, perhaps he'll tune in a bit later, I hope so. Uh, but I will go ahead and give him a quick introduction. I mean, he, not that he needs much of an introduction. He's the former um, Minister of Foreign Affairs of France. He's the founder of the Uber Vedrine Consulate, a public affairs consultancy. He's written over a dozen books and served as president of the Institut Francois Mitterrand, a French president he was very closely associated with. So, enough introductions. Keeping with the WPC format, uh, we'll hear some intro introductory remarks from each of our 
panelists, and then we'll get the discussion hope going, hopefully uh, integrating some input from the floor. So as we're discussing up here, please reflect on any questions you might have and uh, save them for, I'm hoping to bring you in during the last third of, of the event. So without further ado, let's uh, get going with our opening remarks. Um, President uh, Sakyagin. Thank you very much. Yeah, first of all, I would like to thank the Terry de Montbrel and uh, his wonderful team and also people in government of UAE and for hosting us and uh, extended this uh, beautiful and uh, yeah, having us here and uh, giving us this opportunity and this is really timely and informative gathering of world community and the experts and I'm learning a lot. I think uh, Ukraine, since the start of the Russian aggression, they are conducting a textbook example of diplomacy for a long time. And I'm one of the uh, concerned global uh, citizens, and particularly yeah, from the global south, I may say. And now this Ukrainian conflict is uh, coming to the new, new stage, I think. Yeah, now Ukraine is a little bit fading away from the front page because of the new conflict and new war. And because of that, I think uh, uh, Ukraine should do more. And uh, everything depends on Ukraine, first of all, and Ukraine <coughs> should, should have yeah, in, in this war uh, final say because they are suffering a lot. And the one thing we have to think about that what Ukrainians are really saying before that, I, I would like to say that I'm uh, in, in relation with Ukraine. I'm involved in three issues quite deeply. One is uh, environmental damage. And also I'm one of the elders which was founded by the Nelson Mandela and others. And I'm the youngest elder. And we are involved with that. And we visited several times Ukraine and met Ukrainian leaders. And also we are involved with the crime of aggression and humanitarian mission. What Ukrainians are talking about, I think last year in November 2022, Ukrainian President Zelensky introduced his peace formula. That peace formula, if you see, they have 10 issues. But first five issues can be discussed now. Still they are discussing. They discussed in Jeddah and Malta. And the first issue from the first five uh, thing uh, about the first issue is the nuclear safety. And they are talking about the Zaporozhye issue and the Zaporozhye power plant. Second issue, of course, food security. We can talk and the all world community, uh, yeah, main players should uh, pay more attention. Third issue, of course, energy security and Ukraine energy uh, power plants, almost half of them damaged and they want to restore that, and that's an uh, issue, and we are working with that very closely. Uh, fourth issue, of course, prevention of ecocide. You know, because of the blow of the Kakaoha Dam and uh, all those things consequently happened there, that's really big environmental damage and also land mining issue there. And we are working very closely with that, and I think other interested parties also <coughs> following this very closely. Uh, fifth one, of course, release the prisoners and also deportees, including those children. I think it should happen, and we, we have to talk about that around it. But the second part, of course, there are five issues related with the Ukraine's territorial integrity and withdrawal of Russian troops and, uh, you know, special tribunal and also the security structure and confirmation of the uh, wars end, including the signing the document. Those are the uh, um, Ukraine's peace formula. And also President Zelensky uh, raised the issue to have peace summit in Ukraine. And before that, they are conducting international diplomacy. With that, I will uh, stop here for the sake of time. And I hope uh, next time I will, you will give me a floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very glad that you mentioned that 10-point peace plan from Ukraine because uh, that, is, that represents Ukraine's perspective and 
we don't have a representative of Ukraine on our panel, and it's extremely important that we uh, include Ukraine's perspective in, in our discussions today. We did hear from their foreign minister yesterday, and his words are still echoing, I'm sure, uh, in this room. So uh, let's move right on to the next speaker, Bogdan Klich. Thank you very much for having this chance to talk about uh, uh, the Ukrainian uh, challenge. The Ukrainian challenge for all of us uh, again. I do remember our conversation last year when we were talking about uh, first uh, conclusions uh, that we could uh, have after the first phase of uh, uh, this uh, Ukrainian resistance against uh, Russian uh, second invasion on its uh, territory. There are not so many good news from uh, Russian-Ukrainian uh, front, but there is at least one good news from Ukrainian neighborhood. And I'd like to underline that because it uh, refers to my, uh, uh, my country, I'd like to, you to know that Poland is back. That Poland is back. Yeah. Poland is back after uh, uh, recent elections in which 74% uh, of uh, Poles decided to return to the community of values that uh, uh, for many years uh, we attended and uh, we, uh, we were proud of. Uh, I mean, this community consisting of uh, democracy, liberal values, uh, political freedoms, uh, the rule of law, of course, and uh, the rights of uh, minorities. And uh, uh, the government uh, that was responsible for undermining this, uh, uh, this understanding of the West uh, in, uh, in Polish eyes and also in uh, international public opinion will be soon removed from, uh, from power. So our full uh, integration with European Union uh, will be continued. Our uh, cooperation with our main partners and uh, good relationship with uh, uh, our neighbors uh, will be recovered. And, of course, our contribution to, uh, uh, let's say, to support Ukrainians as those who are fighting for those values uh, will be continued. So the, after this declaration, <laughs> important declaration from uh, my national point of view, I can uh, move to, to, to the topic of this uh, discussion. Mm, once uh, during this conference, I described uh, uh, the situation after 2014 and the first invasion of Russian troops uh, on Ukraine together with the creation of the Islamic State as a crescent of fire surrounding Europe from the, from the east and from the south. Now, unfortunately, it exists, and the scale of this uh, fire is uh, much, uh, much bigger. The challenge is much uh, harder for us, I mean for European and Euro-Atlantic uh, community, and the responses to that should be much wiser than uh, after 2014 and 20. 15. So from that point of view, I would say that uh, the results of a uh, NATO summit in Vilnius, recent one, uh, were, uh, were, a good, were a good sign, you know, for uh, implementation of those decisions that were taken one year before, I mean, uh, during the Madrid summit. Uh, we should go this way to implement the new model of uh, forces uh, that was uh, established after the Madrid summit, uh, the new model of uh, forces responsible for reinforcing those countries that would be, um, uh, would be attacked in uh, in future, and uh, the eastern flank of the alliance belongs to this group of uh, countries. Secondly, the number of forces, I mean, this uh, uh, huge increase of forces uh, from the 30,000 to from 40,000 to 300,000 response forces uh, that would be responsible for this reinforcement should be achieved as quickly as possible. The new model of deterrence, this shift from deterrence by punishment to de deterrence by 
denial should be also implemented as quickly as possible. And fourthly, the decision concerning regional plans, regional defense plans, uh, responsible not for reinforcement of uh, a country or a group of countries attacked, but uh, for uh, defending every inch or every square meter of NATO territory should be also implemented. Those four major decisions of Madrid summit repeated uh, by Vilnius summit and implemented to some extent uh, this year are of major importance for security of Euro-Atlantic community. As for the European Union, uh, I believe you know that uh, uh, Russian invasion on Ukraine created a completely new space for the EU, and the EU uh, carried out a kind of Copernican revolution. Copernican revolution in the sense that uh, it was uh, the first time engaged in support, uh, military support of a country not belonging to the European community. Secondly, that it decided to allocate such a huge amount of money for macroeconomic uh, injections into this country budget. Uh, as far as I remember, it was 11.6 uh, billion euros only by the European Union last year. And for this year, we estimate around 18 billion euros when, for the military purposes, we were able to allocate last year 5.6 5.6 billion euros, not counting allocations, not counting financial supports coming from particular member states of uh, the European Union. So this is the huge change in, uh, uh, in uh, activity of the European Union, and it should be continued. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, important points being made there, uh, both in relation to the European Union and NATO. Uh, also. Uh, I'm sure that many people will be glad to hear that Poland is back, and I'm, I'm certain that, that Ukraine is glad to hear what you just said regarding the uh, pledge of support, continued support for Ukraine, because Poland has played a, a, a crucial role in, in strengthening Ukraine as it seeks to, to repel Russia's, Russia's ongoing invasion. Very good. Um, so, Lucky, uh, sorry, Zaki Lady. The floor is yours. Zaki. Okay. Uh, Laki. Uh, is uh, it Laki? Sorry. My, 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 Zaki Ladi. is my first name. Lady is my last name. Of course. Name. Okay. <laughs> my apologies. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here once again with virtually the same panelists uh, to discuss the same topic. So I would like to introduce a kind of uh, dynamic interpretation. And in a nutshell, I will tend to say that nothing has changed since last year, but virtually everything could change. Uh, nothing has changed because we are confronted, and Ukraine is confronted to a violent uh, Russian aggression, which will unfortunately enter its uh, third year next February, which is probably longer than we all expected. The second point, and it had been mentioned by uh, Bogdan, the European support is stronger, and is stronger than ever, and this point should be stressed. Uh, all in all, all in all, we have committed, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about commitment, not disbursement, which are lower, but in terms of commitment, we are around 80 billion euros for Ukraine. Uh, through different mechanism, uh, I'm not enter into detail. And uh, for the first time, our commitments are higher than the American ones. So, and I would like to insist on this, because I had many distinction with the Keel Institute, who constantly insisted on saying that the American commitment was uh, much more important than the European one. And at the end of the day, they realized that our commitments were extremely important, and they actually corrected the figures, and they came to the figure that the European commitments were the higher. Of course, I'm not comparing the United States 
with, uh, with Europe, because virtually we are absolutely on the same line, fortunately. But uh, it's important to say that we are on the forefront. And it, this idea matters if some uh, unfortunate changes take place in uh, the United States in the, in the next uh, future. So the other achievement is that the level of consensus among Europeans is, is still very strong, important, with, of course, some uh, caveats, but by and large is extremely uh, strong. And uh, the reason why uh, it is strong, it's because all European states see in Ukraine a challenge to their security and see in an unfortunate success of Russia, which I cannot uh, imagine, a, a huge uh, blow to our uh, security. And even countries of Europe which were, let's have a, 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 a well, south-oriented, south uh, are now changing their views and, let's say, pivoting towards Central, uh, Central Europe. So this is a huge change which will uh, take place in the uh, two next uh, decades. So Russia, unfortunately, is and will remain a security threat to Europe, and this view is now shared massively by the uh, European. Uh, two main achievements from the European side which have to be uh, mentioned and uh, reaffirmed, uh, we succeeded in putting an end to our energy dependency vis-a-vis -vis Russia, which is a huge achievement. And second, uh, we are probably now on the verge of transferring the frozen assets, uh, Russian assets, uh, to Ukraine. I hope that we will be able to uh, give them the 300 uh, billions of Russian assets which had been frozen. So, in, that, in a sense, everything is fine. But, there are but. Uh, the first, and we have to confess, and even uh, from my personal uh, perspective, uh, the military situation is uh, difficult and much, much more difficult than what expected, compared, for example, to last year. The costs incurred by Russia are absolutely huge, huge, uh, and by Western standards or European standards, they are unbearable, unbearable. And if you see the last months in October, uh, the casualties on the Russian side were absolutely huge and among the, 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 the most important casualties within a month. So they are losing, they are losing. Now, what is unbearable by European standards is perfectly bearable by Russian standards. And we have to take this into account. And you need, in this regard, to read the formidable uh, interview piece written by the uh, chief of staff of Ukraine, uh, General Zelensky in uh, The Economist, which uh, is not extraordinarily optimistic uh, on the evolution of the situation. And in fact, uh, Putin is following, unfortunately, what uh, Stalin said in the past, uh, when he said that to a certain extent, to a certain extent, and I'm sorry because the sentence is terrible, quality, quantity becomes a source of quality. But that's the way uh, Russia behaves. So people are killed en masse, but they are killed and new waves of soldiers arrive. And the problem is that the uh, Ukrainians cannot work on the same footing. So there is an inequality. Uh, so uh, to, to um, stop on, 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 on this, so just to say that's going to be a long war, 
much probably longer than expected. And there is no doubt, there is no doubt that, uh, of course, a kind of fatigue may appear in Europe, but also uh, in, the, uh, in the United States, where the news are not uh, terribly, uh, terribly good, but which will bring, uh, will put the Europeans in front of, of their responsibility. So I will come, if you allow me, later on, on the interaction which seems to me extremely important between what's going on in Ukraine and what's going on in the Middle East. Thank you very much. Uh, it is important to point out that the European support has, has been extraordinary. Uh, U.S. support as well. It's, uh, I think Ukraine has, has emphasized that as well. The, um, the interview that you referred to in The Economist, uh, I highly recommend if, if any of you are interested in this topic, reading further into it. Uh, the, the term that's used in that interview quite a bit is stalemate, and I was, I was rather surprised to hear the, the chief of staff referring uh, openly to that. Um, but we'll, you know, we'll hope to come back to, to those points you were making. Thank you very much. Uh, Norbert Röttgen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure and honor for me. Um, perhaps let me start by reiterating the most important thing, in my view, that has not changed. And this is the, the meaning of this war uh, of Russia against Ukraine. Uh, and this meaning is that the outcome of this war will determine the fate of Europe for decades to come. Because this war is about whether the return of war in Europe as a land war will be accepted and rewarded as a political instrument in the 21st century. If, this, if that were to happen, if war turns out to become a political success, war will remain in Europe, and of course the world will and would draw a lesson from the success of war as a political instrument. And in a way, the world already is learning, because the geopolitical a struggle between China and the United States in a way functions as a protective umbrella for regional actors to just uh, uh, apply war as a political instrument, which we have seen in the Southern Caucasus and which we are now seeing in the Middle East. So under this umbrella, war is coming back in regional conflicts. What we have seen so far is, or so, so the consequence for the Europeans and for the world, I would say, is that is, is a definition of victory. Victory means that, ha, that there has to be a victory over war as a political instrument. This is really fateful. This is crucial and decisive that we beat war as an instrument. Um, this understanding of the hist historic dimension of this war has unified, I could even say reunified, the West, has injected a historic sense again, has contributed members to NATO. So this really has constituted a new West in responding to the return of war into the 21st century and at least into Europe. Um, what we have seen is, I slightly disagree, I think we have seen that again in the situation of a European land war, the US against all the intentions of the United States, which intended to pivot to Asia, was drawn back to Europe and is acting as the number one security power in Europe. The European security power is the United States of uh, America. We could say we are lucky to say this, and we could, should also say it's embarrassing for Europe that uh, we have to say that. However, the war in the Middle East is possibly changing also this role of the United States. It's not only distracting public uh, attention from the war in Ukraine to the Middle East, which is 
good for Vladimir Putin. There is also mounting pressure on the president from the Republican Party and uh, influential uh, uh, elements, for example, now the Speaker of the House, are mounting pressure not only to, to, to reduce support to Ukraine and replace the financial and military support of the United States from, the, from Ukraine to the Middle East. To the Middle East. So there, is, there are increasing doubts whether the United States will, uh, pro, will serve in this role as the number one security provider for America. This is only one reason why we are not going to see an end of this war until the presidential elections. My view is that Vladimir Putin, irrespective of this event, uh, is uh, neither willing nor able to withdraw from Ukraine. I think he is beyond this point. He will stay in, and he has to stay in, because this war, which started as a war to establish, to re-establish a Russian empire in Europe, has become now a war about his very personal political survival, at least as Russian president, perhaps even, even personal survival. So he is not able to withdraw, even if he wished to withdraw. At least he will wait until the presidential election. And if Trump gets re-elected, we will see how the strength of the Europeans are. I doubt that we have become the number one security supplier. Uh, I, I don't talk about commitments, but I would talk about supply and delivery. And there, of course, America is far ahead of the Europeans. If Trump gets re-elected, and even if he not only were to reduce military support, but perhaps strike a deal with Putin and start an economic war with China, then we were to see where Europe is. And because this can't be uh, excluded as a possibility at least, the Europeans should start to prepare for that. My okay. lesson now, after more than one and a half years of this war, is that we really have to wake up to, 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 I, to, to appreciate and recognize, not appreciate, to recognize this war as a European war and that the demand uh, and uh, the necessity that Europe enables itself to provide security for our Europe has become ever more urgent and we have to urgently prepare. The clock is ticking for that and if we are again unprepared for the events we can't exclude but we can clearly foresee we will wake up in a disastrous situation and then we will contribute to the re-establishment of war as a political instrument, even in Europe. That, that was my point. I did. Yes. Thank you very much. I, I did the, the, it, the so point I, about uh, a victory for Putin would be a victory for the notion of war as a political instrument. That helps uh, define a little bit what, what success would look like in, in, in ending this war. Um, I've been told that Hubert Vedrin uh, cannot, uh, we can't okay. get the connection up to Hubert Vedrin. I've seen a, a sign on our monitors here across the front that there is a stable connection could not be formed. Uh, and so I'm afraid that, uh, that we will have to, uh, to go proceed without input from Hubert Vedrin. But if you can hear me, uh, we hope to see you maybe next time. Um, in any case, uh, we will proceed with, with the panel that we have, which we've got a lot on the table already. We've already explored quite, quite a, a bit of territory, important territory, for thinking about the trajectory of the Ukraine war, because while we cannot talk about how it will end, we can talk about how we might want it to end, and we can talk about how Ukraine, of course, wants it to end, and what the principal factors are that will determine uh, the trajectory as we move along. The commitment from the European Union, uh, other European players, also players abroad, not just within the European Union, but the United States is absolutely critical within the context of NATO. Uh, so I, I want to get the conversation going and then I'm going to bring in some, some input from the floor as, as soon as we can. I want to just first put a question uh, to Ebek Dodge uh, Tsakyagin. 
because you look at this from outside of the European Union, um, Mongolia has a, has a special uh, geographical and political location in this discussion. Uh, I want to ask you first about not the future, but where we are right now regarding the West and this war. The West's leaders failed to anticipate and prevent this war, Russia's invasion of Ukraine in, in February of 2022. Uh, how much has that in itself damaged the West and its standing in the world? I think this war is not uh, between West and South. I mean between the global West and uh, the global South. I think this war is actually a long fought war between autocracy and democracy. I, uh, that's, that, that's a pretty popular view, actually. Yeah, yeah. personally, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, when, when I was in office, yeah, I was very closely working with Putin. And uh, I think uh, I, I really regret that Putin started this war. I think one of the main reasons if that free Ukraine, if that democratic Ukraine, if that Ukraine with uh, Europe, you know, integrated with Europe, if Ukraine became more successful, yeah. it would be that successful Ukraine would be bad example for Russia, for his rule. I think because of that, Putin started this war to punish. And my country actually since 1990, between Russia and China, circled by Russia and China, only democracy, only surviving 33 years, democracy there, means that between us, there is only one country, free democratic Ukraine, free democratic Mongolia. In terms of that, I think this war has global implication. If we, if we lose, I think we means the free world lose in Ukraine, those autocrats will be encouraged. If Ukraine prevails, free world prevails, I think those autocrats will be discouraged. Even in Russia, even in Asia, even in Latin America, even in Africa. Because of that, this war has really big global implication. Of course, this <coughs> war has a original implication that European and all, all we are talking about, and uh, we, we call Ukraine, is a gate to the Europe. I think uh, Europe, as a uh, original structure and continent, they don't want to keep their enemy inside their gate. I think that enemy should be outside of gate. I think because of that, Ukraine also fighting for that. And uh, I think since the start of this war, actually world community was very supporting Ukrainian cause and also blaming Russian aggression. And we all know that at the United Nations, 141 nations actually blamed Russian aggression. All the five countries, including Russia, they supported it, all the five. I think it's still this kind of support, hard, solid. But there are some cracks. And because of that, I started that. Ukraine has brilliant uh, diplomacy, and they have to do more. And also, I have, yeah, for the Ukraine, I have one idea that Ukraine should be more engaging, less reactionary. And uh, also, so, may I, more engaging in what sense? Yeah, more, more engaging with the with with all over the world, with the, with the all countries. You know, they they have to rally. They they have to push for the new diplomacy. Yesterday we heard the foreign minister. I think his answer was brilliant, and question was of course brilliant questions, and his answer and was really good. And uh, and Ukrainians are feeling that uh, something is changing there. Even in Europe, there are some countries. Mm. And, and, and okay. because of that, I think Ukraine needs more, more engaging. Also, okay. Ukraine should be more graceful. Also, Ukraine should be more thankful to the world community, even including the global south. OK. If, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring in some, uh, if you have any questions, uh, start you know, thinking about raising your hand. I'm just going to put one our critical question, basically our headline question to the panel before we bring in that from the audience and give, give each of you a quick, quick opportunity to, to respond to this. And that is, 
uh, you know, the West, the West, we talked about, we even defined it at the beginning of this program. What about the, how this war is in the way that it's being prosecuted and the way the support that it's being get, getting, the Ukraine has been getting from Europe and the rest of the world and the United States above all, how is, how is this war affecting the West's status? Okay, I, uh, I have to disagree on first the way you are framing the debate and to disagree respectfully with our Mongolian friend for the following reason. I think that it would be a terrible mistake to frame the conflict in Ukraine in terms of the Western world against the rest of the world. It's a terrible mistake. It's a terrible mistake. And the high representative, and I'm very proud to work with him, <coughs> is doing his best not to frame the problem in those terms. Why? Because the crux of the matter is the respect of territorial integrity of an independent state, which independence had been recognized by the United Nations and by a large number of big powers, including Russia. So you start saying that only uh, democratic states are liable for that is a terrible mistake. All attempts aiming at putting the West on one side and the rest of the world are doomed to failure, and this is one of the worst mistakes. So I, I will never, ever talk in terms of the West against the rest. That's the way some people would like to see us framing the problem. But we, we are actually, I'm, you, I, I'm, I'm surprised because you are constantly talking about the West. And it's you're in not the title, I yeah, didn't make no, it up. You, you're not, you're, <laughs> Sorry. I'm referring to Europe. Sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm introducing uh, a, a, a sort of debate. I'm, 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 t I'm talking about Europe. The less, the less politically speaking, I'm talking politically speaking because I'm, I, I, in a sense, a political actor. Uh, the less we frame the problem in terms of the West, against the rest, the more uh, we, we gain support. But because when you are in front of the countries from the global south, okay, I can tell you the objections they are making on Ukraine. And it is independent from the nature of the government, okay? I mean, we talk to hundreds of governments all over the world, democratic, non-democratic, leftist, and non-leftists, and virtually, and virtually, they have the, 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 the same view. What are their views? They have uh, different just, views. Just, be, be, I mean, I'm sure they, they do. I mean, this is an important debate, and important points that you're bringing up, the whole question yeah. uh, about the global south and how it's perceiving yeah, but, what's going on. And I take your point also on, on the West. Uh, it's, is it a useful term or not? I, you know, I'm, I'm not one to really say that it's a wonderfully useful term, but I think it's also important to point out that we're not necessarily talking about a binary opposition here, the West and the rest, but rather, as I defined the West just for the purpose of our conversation at the beginning, uh, a group of mainly liberal democracies who hold uh, principles of a rules-based international order, which includes territorial integrity as being you know, very you know, sacrosanct. Anyway, there's that part. But when we, and we can define it as in terms of autocracy and democracy, as that sort of uh, c conflict. But the point I'm, I think we're trying to, to, to look at here is whatever you want to call those countries who, that Ukraine and those countries supporting it represent, whether you want to call them, I don't know, you can, I'll let you use whatever term you wish to use on that side, Ukraine's side, to use a neutral term. Uh, and whatever Russia represents, in this terms, as, as uh, Norbert Röttgen described, a threat to uh, the notion of, how did he put it, uh, of using war as uh, a, a p political instrument, that this is, the, yeah. the, the, that idea being coming into conflict. So 
just, just to make sure that we're not really setting up a, a, a false dichotomy here with the West and, and the rest in our discussion. Yeah, I, mean, I, I want to, in, I know I just, we have, we have 27 minutes left. Okay. I do want to get input from the audience, and I hope perhaps they'll direct some questions to you. But before we do that, uh, Zaki Lady has, uh, has indicated his, uh, or excuse me, uh, Bogdan Klik has indicated his wish to uh, intervene. I wanted to, to underline that according to my understanding of uh, this conflict and another, I mean uh, Hamas aggression against Israel, we can talk and we should talk about the West because we are, we are united not only by our uh, similar interests, but we are community of values. And the, those values are uh, in the basis uh, of our political systems. They are introduced into the Washington Treaty Preamble, they were introduced into the Lisbon Treaty, uh, Article 2. Uh, uh, so they, are, they express, you know, the unity and cohesion of uh, our community. That's why this war of Russia against Ukraine is also the war against the West. We are, we were, threatened by uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin uh, on the eve of the second aggression uh, when ultimatum was presented to, the, to, to NATO. Let's not forget about, uh, about that because it was in effect the, the, attempt, the, the attempt to reverse the, the, the history of recent uh, 20, 20 years. Yeah. Secondly, uh, we shouldn't divide, uh, the, uh, let's say, the involvement of the United States from the involvement of the European partners, because the basis for this uh, coherent uh, reaction of uh, the West uh, f uh, after the 24th of February 2022 was uh, the meeting by President uh, Biden with uh, European partners in June 2021, when he visited the first time Europe with this message, America is back. So it was the, uh, uh, let's say, reconstruction of the cohesion of, uh, of NATO, the role of the United States in Europe as a major provider of security to European partners, and thirdly, the cooperation with the European Union by the United States that was not at this uh, level before. United States, uh, in June 2021, recognized the European Union as an indispensable partner for the security issues. Not only security, but many security issues. So those three factors should be taken into consideration because they were, let's say, undermined by President Putin's aggression against Ukraine. And very briefly, Ukrainians are also dying for, uh, for Western uh, democratic uh, liberal uh, values. Uh, they decided in 2013 belong to the community of, uh, to this community of values, and it was the beginning of their problems with, uh, huge problems with Russian Federation. Let's not forget about that, that, that Ukraine fights also for democratic set of values. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I want to bring okay. in Norbert, okay, Norbert, okay, okay, great. All right, because I would have, would have brought you in here with a question, anyway. Yeah, but um, questions from the audience. I, or I see one, two, three hands. We're going to collect three questions and then move from there. We'll begin here in the, in the front. Uh, Well, my name is Friedbert Flüger. Uh, I'm German. I've been a colleague of Norbert Röttgen in the German Bundestag for 20 years. Uh, and uh, I would first of all say to Bogdan, he was very modest because not only Poland is back, but he is back. He was re-elected by 71%, which is a wonderful victory, and we should, uh, we should mention that. Bogdan. Uh, and, and uh, Bogdan, I want to address that, what you just said. You said NATO has been strengthened by this war. There is new unity. U.S. is back stronger uh, in Europe than ever. Uh, and Europe has lived up to that challenge. But if I hear the undertones in this discussion, 
uh, I think we have to put some question marks. And I would like to be advocatos diaboli and point a picture, and I'm hopefully that you can uh, bring forward the counter arguments. Well, the West is pretty weak. You are right, NATO, pretty good, but look to the United States, and we see this enormous polarization, and we don't know whether Mr. Trump will, will win next time. Sir, look if to you the could e formulate yeah, a yeah, question. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming you. very yeah. short to the question. EU, the same thing. Uh, look to, to Israel and the war in Israel and the EU position to that. So the question is whether we are not well advised to, to follow Mr. Zaki Laidi's uh, position, not to say it is just the West. If we want regulations in foreign affairs, we should not say it is only the West who is asking for that. Uh, if we do that, I think we found ourselves pretty much isolated in this world. Look at this BRICS uh, meeting that we had. People are fed up with this polarization. They want regulations. They do not want to, that war wins, as Norbert has put it. But if we put it as this is a Western value or a Western point, I think we are not doing the right thing. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, this, this obviously is feeding into the whole discussion about the Global South and, and the West in, in these terms, whether they're useful and what the perceptions are uh, around the world and whether we need to maybe come up with new terms. So let's, we're going to take two more questions. We'll allow yeah, you, to, okay. of course, to answer uh, to that in a moment. But first, uh, the gentleman in the one, two, three, four, fourth row, please. And then we'll take one more question from that side. I think I, I see you. Thank right you, Hiro Akita from Tokyo. So, um, definitely, uh, defeat of Ukraine is bad scenario, but uh, maybe worst scenario is simul simultaneous war in Europe and Asia. Obviously, uh, there are many, many focal points like a Taiwan Strait or Korean Peninsula. So, my question is, uh, how should we avoid the same scenario of World War One or World War Two? in which uh, war in Europe spilled over to Asia, especially World War II, spilled over within two years after German invaded Poland in 1939. Then two years after that, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. So timeline was very, very fast. So my question is, how should we both win, both in Ukraine, but also deter China simultaneously? Thank you. Okay. So we've got uh, the whole question about the West again, emphasizing that, but we've also got now the question of, of spillover. How do we avoid that? And there's a gentleman there in, in the hall. We'll take that question and then, oh. My, uh, Thank sorry. you very and much. And then we'll, we'll move over to the front here. Sorry, just a moment. Yeah. Volker Pertis from, from Berlin. If, if Norbert Rutkin is right, and I think he is, that Europe has to prepare itself from now to provide security for fellow Europeans threatened <coughs> by a power that doesn't respect the territorial integrity and sovereignty of its neighbors. If that is the case, what does it mean, and I would like you, Norbert, and probably your fellow Europeans to further elaborate, what does that mean for the institutional development of Europe? What does it mean for budgets? And what does it mean for the narrative which your party and others will have to pursue in the coming European elections. Thank you. Boy, that's a, that's a complex question. We could put together a whole panel on that. Uh, thank you, Volker Pertes. Uh, and we will take one additional question. Thierry Montbriot, uh, Montbriot had, uh, had drawn my attention to a lady in the front. Well, thank you, Elisabeth Guigou from France. I'm very happy that uh, at the beginning of the discussions, uh, Bogdan and Zaki and Norbert have given us some kind, some signs of optimism in this very uh, gloomy and worrying uh, context. So I want to come back to the European Union as they did at the beginning. After the war, and of course, it depends on how long this war will last and on which conditions it will end. But after the war, supposing 
that what we hope here is that Ukraine wins the war and can negotiate on acceptable terms uh, some kind of peace. What should be, in the view of the panelists, what should be the degree of autonomy, strategic autonomy, of the European Union vis-a-vis -vis the United States? And given the fact that the European Union obviously will support the uh, massive co cost of the reconstruction of Ukraine. Thank you. So there's a lot on the table here. Um, much of it is, is institutional, focused on, on the European Union, uh, concerns about that and the whole question of, of strategic autonomy, uh, which has been around a big discussion for a long time. But what we get a feeling for here and also the, the broader global debate, because this does plug into the global debate about the West and what it is and what it stands for and what's at stake here, but also the questions of this possibly spilling over. There has been a great deal of discussion about any lessons that uh, maybe other countries are taking from the Ukraine war about how to pursue its own foreign policy interests by violating another, uh, another area's territorial integrity. So let's uh, get some responses from, from the panelists. Again, a lot on, from the panel, a lot on the table. Uh, who would like to begin? Uh, Norbert Lutkin. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And perhaps I would pick uh, the question of Volker Pautis. He asked if, if what does European security mean in terms of institutions, budgets, and narrative? And I, I would answer these questions in reverse order because when you start with a narrative, the answers uh, uh, follow out of this, out of this, uh, of, of the response to the narrative. Yes, I think there is space and room and necessity for a European narrative. And only if you think about the possibility of an election of Donald Trump, which I consider as the nightmare uh, as such. We have the war in Europe, we have the war in the Middle East, but this, this, this implosion of the West from inside, uh, there is, this is the real threat to the West, not from the outside, but from the inside. So if you just consider this for a moment as a possibility which can't be excluded, then the narrative is absolutely clear. We have to provide as Europeans for the security of our Europe. And security has become also in different in, in other areas. Uh, the new paradigm. There is, f people feel scared. Uh, they, they, they feel not uh, protected in different areas. In the economy, but also in, in uh, this area of physical uh, uh, military uh, security. So I think this is the core narrative we have to develop and we can sell because it is the truth. It is what we are facing, that we have to provide uh, and care for ourselves and we can't rely uh, only and solely as we have done in the decade of the Cold War on America. And I say and I add, even if, if uh, uh, Joe Biden were to be re-elected, there will never be a time, as we have seen in the Cold War, when a Europe was only the receiver of European security. He will come back at some time to the new priorities of American policy, which is the reconstruction of the American uh, economy and, of course, the competition with China. So, either way, we will have to face this necessity. And if once we have made this clear, that this is the historic challenge of our time for Europe, then the, the, the ensuing questions get the answer. Of course, the budget has to follow uh, the essence, what is necessary for our time, and the institutions will adapt to, uh, to a policy which is necessary. So I'm, I'm well, not well, scared about that. May I ask you though, just to intervene, yeah. uh, do you see the political will within the, among the European Union member states to come up with the ag agreement and the resources to create those, to strengthen those institutions, particularly on the military and defense side? Because right now the European Union does not even yeah. have that identity outside of NATO. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, what we can say that we have remarkably developed. 
So the, the state of mind and the state of policies after the war compared to the pre-war time is fundamentally different. For example, Germany, I really can say our society, our attitudes Absolutely. have as profoundly, as quickly changed as it has never occurred in the post-war period. However, I admit, not sufficiently. If you, if you measure it with the past, profoundly impressively. If you measure it against the, uh, what is necessary, insufficiently. So my answer to your question is, we could act out of insight and foresight. I do not expect this, unfortunately. What I fear is that we will act and more react out of necessity. We could avoid it, uh, we could be better prepared, but I think it's not hard to predict the circumstances that Europe has to um, bring itself to a, level, uh, where, to, to a level of responsibility because we are forced to act. And then Europe is acting quite, quite um, convincingly. I would just p point out at this point that the, the need that many see for reforming uh, institutional reform in the European Union, uh, also in terms of its decision-making process when it comes to foreign and security policy, if it's going to be only unanimous decision-making, that's going to be a difficult ask. Okay, we'll, we'll bring in Saki Lady, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm always amazed uh, in such a debate to see to what extent the Europeans, the European Union, is constantly underrated, okay? And your comments, which are coming from a non-European view, but it's perfectly <laughs> acceptable, are the perfect illustration of this. I've lived longer you started, in Europe than you anywhere else. You started talking <laughs> about the, uh, the limited effort, but I think that uh, uh, Mr. Rodgen made it very clear. I mean, the changes which took place in Germany are absolutely impressive. At the beginning of the war in Ukraine, people were laughing at the Germans because they had in mind to just send helmets to the Ukrainians. 5,000. Now, 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 Germany is the first provider of military aid to Ukraine behind the United States, okay? Huge change. And the, quality, and the quality of the German equipment is outstanding. So I, as a European, <coughs> I'm very proud to defend what the Germans have done and the changes which took place. And even in regard to their uh, energy dependency, what Germany did is absolutely formidable. So I remember meetings uh, of the Gimnik just before the beginning of the war and journalists coming to the HRVP and telling him, but how, how can you have, expect having a common position of Russia whereas you are all divided? But he told him, wait a minute, wait the end of the, of the meeting and you, you'll see. And what happened after the meeting? That was the, the decision to take very harsh sanctions against, uh, against Russia. So, in terms of military effort, a change is taking place. But, of course, it's not going to happen uh, within a year or, or two years. It's a sea change. And let me just come to three questions. But, in fact, I don't see a lot of disagreement among us. This sea uh, change, just to interrupt. Yeah, but the, 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 very the word Titanwende, I believe, is, is something that has been, has been put out there now that on, in a result, on, result on, of this. On the EU-US relations, I think that we do agree that this uh, relationship is absolutely crucial, uh, fundamental. It's no, nobody's uh, this, the, I mean, putting into question the importance of this uh, relationship. But I think that we do all agree now that we need to make a, 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 a European effort on our side and because we cannot foresee what could happen in, uh, in the future. Now, the point on which I, I disagree uh, respectfully with you, it concerns the Global South. I mean, if you go to the Global South and tell them that in Ukraine we are defending Western values and you need to share the values, you are going to face a huge opposition. So you should certainly not bring to them the Ukrainian issue 
through the lenses of democracy because uh, you, you have to put uh, the emphasis on the, integri uh, the uh, territorial integrity of nation states. And in fact, you have democracies which are going to tell you, well, that's your problem, it's not yours. And if you take Latin America, why, I mean, is it part of the West or not? Is it part of the West or not, okay? So if you take Latin America, I mean, most of countries, almost all of them are democratic countries, but their narrative um, and their interpretation of the conflict is not very different from Asian or African countries. They tell, okay, there was an aggression, but there are so many aggression in the rest of the world. And secondly, uh, it's an aggression, but don't expect from us more than condemning the, uh, the aggression because we have our own agenda and we don't want to see the Ukrainian agenda hijacked by other issues which are uh, much more important for us. And this narrative and this perception is widely uh, uh, present in the, in, in, in the world. And it doesn't matter if countries are democratic and non-democratic, African, Latin Americans, or Asian. It, it's simply not the truth. I mean, you have to look at the reality of the world as it is, and not as you expect it to be. Thank you. Um, Bogdan well, Kleet, uh, perhaps you can pick up on, on some of those points and also maybe speak to the, the question that was raised concerning the, the risk of spillover uh, in this, because that's a quite, quite great concern. Together with uh, Robert Gates, the United States faces more serious threats to its security today than it has faced in decades, perhaps ever. It has not before faced four allied adversaries at the same time, Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, whose combined nuclear arsenal could be nearly twice the size of the US within a few years. This is uh, Bob Gates. Uh, of course, this is the specific situation of the US responsible not only for security in Euro-Atlantic area, but also engaged in other parts of, uh, of the globe. But let's not forget, you know, that, uh, uh, that to some extent this is also our problem, because the West consists, as we know, uh, of uh, two parts of the Atlantic uh, Ocean. That's why... Uh, uh, I am absolutely aware that there is a difference between those threats coming uh, uh, from the East and from the South. Mm -hmm. From the East, we have traditional, conventional threat in the form of military aggression, full-scale aggression in the neighborhood of, uh, of Europe. When in the South, we, have, uh, we face more asymmetric, uh, more asymmetric threats because uh, Nobody can predict that even the, the bad evolution of uh, uh, Hamas-Israeli war can, be, uh, can create, a, a, um, create a military danger for, for Europe. There can be massive uh, 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 migration flows. There can be a next wave of uh, terrorist attacks on our soil in the European Union. There can be various uh, cuts of uh, energy supplies to, to Europe, but uh, those uh, threats are different. That's why we should be prepared for with different uh, responses to those uh, threats. When we speak about, uh, about the US uh, possible policy or strategy after new elections, uh, presidential elections in the United States, yes, this is one of the main challenges for us, for the, for the West, and nobody can predict what will happen in the US, so we should be prepared to keep Americans in as we kept Americans in during the first uh, Donald Trump's presidency. Of course, political cohesion of, uh, of the alliance was undermined because of Donald Trump's uh, approach. But thanks to the commanders, uh, uh, great commanders of the US uh, armed forces, NATO cooperation, military cooperation was going uh, ahead. Mm -hmm. 
what we should do, what should we do in Europe, uh, referring to what Elizabeth asked about. Uh, this is the Spanish presidency right now that concentrated uh, our thinking about uh, uh, strategic autonomy only on social economic issues. We abandoned uh, this military, po political military aspect during last, uh, last month no. because of this good cooperation with the United States because mainly of the Russian-Ukrainian war. We should keep thinking in those categories, social economic categories, about, uh, about the European uh, strategic uh, autonomy. Okay. Not forgetting, only one sentence, not forgetting about the security and defense union that could be achieved according to the existing treaties. Because there is no mood for changes of treaties uh, uh, in the European Union, but we can go farther with uh, the European Defense and Security Union within the European Union. This is uh, one of the uh, possible directions. Thank you. Uh, we only have one minute and 30 seconds left, so I'd, I'd like to give uh, Epic Deutsch uh, Takajin a yeah, chance thank to you. intervene. Yeah. You know, I think uh, to live free, it's a universal desire, not the Western or Eastern sure. or Southern desire. This is universal desire. Why we choose freedom? I think because of that. We want to live free. And in my country, freedom is non-negotiable because freedom equals to our independence. Freedom equals to our, our right to exist. And be, I, I know in the West you may see some uh, socialists or even communists, even friends of autocrats. I think it's not a new thing. But desire to live free is very important. That's a universal thing. But other thing I really concerned that this uh, Middle Eastern conflict and also there are flash conflicts in, the, in Asia, South China Sea, Taiwan, and Korean Peninsula. And also North Koreans are delivering that arsenal, that weapons. They say almost 1,000 containers of weapons, and I, say, I read that. Those things little, yeah, concerning. And uh, maybe if there is more flash points, it may next in Asia. If that uh, come this war or conflict become more global, I think that's nightmare. Because of that, we have to talk about uh, more issues related with the global things. Not the, of course, we have to pay attention regionally. Thank you. Thank you very much. You ended directly on zero, zero. Uh, congratulations <laughs> for that. Uh, we are out of time. Uh, uh, it's obvious that we could continue the discussion for a long time. You said there's much need for discussion. Fortunately, we are at a place where we have uh, some uh, brilliant minds and some, some really experienced policymakers and, and analysts to help us uh, put things into context. I really appreciate your input from, from all of you. I, I was hoping for a frank uh, and open discussion. We oh, got no, that. Sure, sure, uh, it's sure. a really, really difficult subject. I hope we can follow it up perhaps bilaterally at some point. I want to thank our audience for being with us today and uh, feel, please feel free to, uh, you know, to continue our discussion maybe in, in the, later on. Thank you. Warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.